Uh, my name is Vladimir Solonar. I'm a professor at the University of Central Florida in Orlando, Florida. I'm originally from Moldova, Chisinau. Uh, my book, uh, this is the second book of mine, it's called The Satellite Empire, Romanian Rule, Southwestern Ukraine, 1941-44. It was published by Cornell University Press in uh, 2019. Well, there was a book on um, the history of uh, Odessa after the Romanian occupation, which was published in 1957 by Alexander Dalin, um, at that time very important historian um, of uh, World War II and of the German occupation of the Soviet territories. The book was published mostly on the basis of the interviews with the um, um, refugees from that area. And um, it, it, it's it, it's an interesting book, it's a good book, but he had no access to the archives. So the first thing is that I had access to the archives, uh, Romanian and Soviet and also German, um, the extensive collection of survivors, uh, testimonies, and um, um, uh, also I studied the whole region um, not only Odessa, so the whole region of Transnistria, uh, which was uh, the region between the Dniester and um, Buch, southern, southern Buch rivers, right with the center of Odessa, but that was a bigger region. There is a whole chapter in my book out of three chapters, which is dedicated to um, the study of the responses of the local population. Uh, that is, um, um, I basically categorize those responses in three following manner, uh, in the following manner, the three types, right? So collaboration, adjustment, and resistance. And so um, this is something that uh, Baum doesn't uh, cover. I need, however, to add that my book uh, doesn't um, discuss the issue of the uh, persecution of uh, Jews and um, Roma in the region, and um, some people rebuke me for this, but it's a misunderstanding because, in fact, I'm currently writing a book on this particular subject. It would be a sequel, and it, um, I, I, it's, uh, it's about the uh, Romanian policy and the Romanian perpetrators. I want to understand their motivations, how they acted, how the machinery of destruction worked generally, right? And I decided that to cram those two topics, well, in fact, several topics, and plus this big topic on the persecution of Jews and Roma, in the same book would, move, would make the book unwieldy, and basically the publisher, publishers do not like it two thick books and they told me if it will be more than this number of pages we won't publish it so I needed to take it into consideration now I'm very happy writing this other book and uh, uh, very excited about it so eventually I will cover this subject too if everything will be okay uh, relations between uh, Romania and the Soviet Union were strained throughout the uh, interwar period and at the center of it was the problem of Bessarabia, because um, uh, the Soviets never recognized uh, what they believed was annexation of Bessarabia by, or they actually called it uh, occupation, um, by uh, Romania in um, 1918. Um, they always um, claimed that uh, the de facto a border between the uh, Soviets and um, and Romania along the Nistia River was not a border, uh, but demarcation line. And uh, so this claim on Bessarabia right, was never completely withdrawn, although at some point in time they came close to it, but then both sides kind of recoiled from uh, this. And uh, uh, so this was a constant thorn. Uh, in the side of their uh, relationship uh, during this period, but uh, but um, the situation came to its head in 1940 when, um, um, in the wake of the um, France's defeat by Nazi Germany, when 
Romania found itself without its traditional allies in the West, um, the Soviets used the provisions of the secret protocol to the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact and the situation in Europe in general to um, advance an ultimatum to uh, Romania requesting uh, uh, um, how they, they call return of uh, Bessarabia to the Soviet Union, and they added at the last moment uh, Bukovina, then Germans persuaded them to limit their claims on, only to the uh, northern Bukovina, which never was a part of the Russian Empire, so they added it as kind of the last moment, and eventually the Romanians ceded those territories, which was for them was um, the uh, great national tragedy, and also it was the beginning of the dismemberment of what they called Great Romania, that is um, the country which uh, included not only all of today's um, Romanian, but also southern Dobrogea, which now belongs to um, uh, Bulgaria, and um, also northern Transylvania, which is still part of Romania today, but was occupied at that time by, by Hungary. So, in a short while during the summer and early fall of 1940, Romania lost all of those territories, and the beginning was um, of this process of the dismemberment was the loss of Bessarabia and of Bukovina. So, of course, there was a lot of anger against the Soviets in Romania, and um, a very strong desire to get those churches back. So, um, since um, 1940, the end of uh, the summer of early fall uh, 1940, uh, there was a political crisis in Romania, mostly engendered by, by those territorial losses, and then unpopular king Karol had to resign. A new king, um, his son um, Michael, stepped into his stead, and a new government, uh, in fact, a military dictator, um, General Antonescu, was um, um, uh, brought to power. So, from that moment on and until August 1944, Romania was led by that um, uh, military general, who was also a very strong nationalist, and of course, for whom the restoration of um, Greater Romania in its borders was kind of the major governing principle. So when um, Hitler let him know uh, that he was going to attack the Soviet Union, and he knew it um, at least several weeks before the attack, but uh, quite possibly much earlier, like maybe six months before that, right? Um, he, he was very eager to join. Um, uh, Hitler in its attack on the Soviet Union. And of course, here he reflected the majority opinion of the Romanians, who all of them supported the government in its quest to um, return uh, Bessarabia and Northern Bukovina. But Antoniescu actually, in some respects, was um, more supportive of Hitler than most Romanians were. He ideologically, he was very much on the right. He was a hardcore nationalist. He shared many ideological um, uh, kind of parameters parameters with Hitler. He was uh, ardent anti-Semite. He, he blamed Jews for everything bad which happened to Romania. And um, um, he, he um, decided to fight with the Hitler uh, after Bessarabia, together with Hitler against the Soviet Union, uh, after Bessarabia and Northern Bukovina were reoccupied um, by, um, uh, by Romania, he sent Romanian armies further to the east, and eventually they uh, ended up at Stalingrad, where they were um, mightily trounced by the Red Army. And then the process, as a compensation for Romanian war effort, Hitler invited um, um, uh, Romanians to occupy uh, part of the Soviet Union. He told them you can take as much as, as you want. 
but of course he didn't mean that as much as he wanted he, he a particular territory and eventually they they came to conclusion that this piece of authority would be occupied by Romania and then was of course kind of ambiguity there as the Romanians was, was were going to annex this territory make it part of their national territory or were they just occupying it for the purposes of extracting resources during the war in order to support its um, war efforts and maybe as as they, as they called it uh, a mortgage to have a better um, negotiating positions after World War I uh, II because as long as they believe that the World War II will end up with the victory of Germany um, Romanians, uh, of course, were not against annexing this territory, but um, they uh, didn't want. Uh, it, it was a it, it was a kind of ambiguous uh, diplomatic situation for them because their first priority was the return of northern uh, Transylvania, which for them was very important kind of national aim, and they didn't want Germans and Hungarians to get a reason to claim that since Romania was compensated by Transnistria, they forfeited their right to Northern Transylvania. So because of that, they never actually announced annexation of Transnistria, but at least at the beginning, they certainly very, were very much into it. And so annexation an of Transnistria was kind of as the result, not annexation, sorry, occupation of Transnistria was a kind of a result of this very peculiar factors, a lot of contingencies coming together. Um, not everybody in, in Romania s supported this uh, occupation, um, nationalists supported pro-Western uh, opposition was against because they didn't like the idea of Romania fighting on the side of Hitler's Germany. They uh, wanted as soon as possible to restore relations with Britain and America. And um, British, in fact, eventually announced war uh, on uh, Romania when Romanians refused to stop at the Dniester River. And so um, uh, Romanians kind of um, themselves were a little divided about what they what they wanted to do eventually, but uh, the government itself, the army, agreed at least at one point they wanted to use this territory as um, a kind of um, um, the reservoir of um, cheap resources. So the idea of pumping as, as much. Uh, much as possible resources, agricultural first of all, uh, to keep the population uh, fed in Romania. Of course, uh, Romania was an agriculture country. One, one could ask why did they needed more agricultural goods, but in fact, uh, in forty one and forty two, they had two bad harvests, and so deliveries from Transnistria were important to keep the population and the cities happy. Right, and um, they also uh, were obligated to deliver a lot of agricultural goods to uh, Germany. So the deliveries from Transnistria was counted as part of the deliveries from uh, from Romania, and so it also is the burden on uh, Romanian economy. So um, then they started basically dismantling uh, industrial goods in Transnistria and moving factories and um, uh, various enterprises into Romania. It also was, and, and they also, well, they, they c c uh, committed other pl plunders as well. So uh, the idea of using Transnistria was something c kind of everybody agreed and, and they, and they uh, indeed plundered a lot of uh, assets of various kinds um, in Transnistria and shipped them into Romania. And another use of this territory, which was also kind of um, not planned in advance, but just happened as a result of various contingencies, was that Transnistria became kind of a dumping ground for various ethnic undesirables from Romania. So uh, the Jews from uh, Bessarabia and Bukovina, uh, some Jews from uh, R Romania per se, um, at one point in time, they didn't, they uh, they planned to deport much more Jews than they eventually deported, but 
and then they abandoned these plans. They also deported a part of their Roma population. They didn't want to keep them there forever. The initial idea was that once the war would be over, they would expel these populations. Probably many others still fed to the to the east, as uh, Antonescu himself put it once in the Council of Ministers, uh, beyond the Ural Mountains. So those were the plans, right? But because the war didn't go as they wanted, but eventually they simply kept this population interesting since, since there were no resources to feed them. Um, they partially killed them, partially let them die in uh, ghettos and concentration camps without s sufficient resources to support themselves and uh, exposing them to epidemics. So, of, of particular of Kaifa. So, those were the two, in fact, uh, major aims for which they used Transnistria uh, during World War um, II. But that was kind of the big scheme of things on the ground. Uh, there was a separate dynamic in terms of how the local administration behaved and how they acted, and also how the local population reacted. Uh, to the advent of Romanian administration and installation, and in fact to the policies pursued in the region. Thank you for this question. Indeed, I, I spent a lot of time on researching this subject and then writing on that. And that's that's a very um, engaging conversation here. Um, it's a subject that's still um, only inadequately understood, mostly because of the persistence of the Soviet myth of World War II as a period of the struggle of all Soviet people against the occupiers and, and the, this um, self abdication in the struggle. But of course, the reality was much more complex. And uh, at least at the beginning, the population was only too happy to see the Soviets go. Of course, we need also to bear in mind that those people who stayed in the area were to a considerable extent some selected group because those who wanted to go, they went away. They um, uh, see um, the uh, Odessa was taken only on the uh, 18th of October, so they had plenty of time to, to go away. Although not everybody who wanted, in fact, was able to, but many did. And so those who um, decided to stay um, uh, remained and um, some of those who wanted to go uh, had to remain too. Uh, and those who stayed, uh, most of them uh, actually were very, to, very happy to see the Soviets go because, um, of course, um, the memory of Holodomor was very much still in um, the mind of the uh, local people, the memory of uh, Stalinist repression, the great purge in uh, the minds of local uh, intelligentsia in particular, right, that Odessa was an important cultural and scientific academic center. And uh, people, um, of course, remain, uh, remember that and they were still horrified, right? So for them, it was practically a liberation and um, they, um, uh, uh, hoped that uh, the better time came, right? And now what followed after that was a kind of a mixed bag because um, uh, Romanian policy towards intelligentsia, uh, what they call them intellectuals, intellectuali in, Rom in Romanian, uh, and that's part of the Romanian culture. They have this, uh, what probably to uh, English speaking audience could be designated as even an inordinately high respect to intellectuals, uh, people of intellect, well, of, of cultural producers, right? And they adopted the um, posture of patronizing arts in this. That's in this particular is in this. They actually were uh, awed by what they saw in this city. They uh, were very impressed by the quality of the local um, theater of uh, opera and ballet. Uh, they appreciated the quality of the local troupe. And Antonescu, in fact, uh, 
visited the theater himself several times and then referred disparagingly to a, a Romanian artist as basically good for nothing in comparison with Odessa. You can, you can imagine how Ministry of Culture <laughs> uh, uh, kind of reacted um, to himself, right, uh, listening to that, right. And, and they adopted this, this stance of uh, patronizing Odessa in, in intelligentsia. And um, they created also avenues for uh, those people participation in the anti-communist propaganda, also on the pages of the local newspaper, which actually the press was thriving during this time, right? And in the cultural life, and many did participate, right? With the former Soviet professors of scientific, whatever, communism or um, political economy of capitalism, you know, Marxist stuff, they all participated. Uh, I'm sorry, at that time they didn't have scientific communist particular subject at universities, but yeah, uh, political economy and, and uh, philosophy and all of this, they participated in anti communist uh, propaganda. All right, and um, also people like philologists, also uh, writers participated in this in this um, anti-communist uh, propaganda. Um, so most of them, I think, supported uh, Romanians to the very end, with the very few exceptions. Uh, some were rattled by uh, the policy of Romanianization that is kind of promotion of Romanian uh, language, um, request to learn Romanian language was nobody learned Romanian language. It was impossible to show the period of time, but there was a obligatory courses to visit. So some, some of them were rattled, but mostly intelligentsia people liked it. And many were very eager to go and live with Romanian. And some did, but then since Soviets occupied Romania, were arrested by the Soviets and brought back. Some escaped eventually to the West, especially people of uh, German ethnic origin, right? And not only, but especially, right? Mm. Okay. Uh, so this is one story. Another story, the situation of uh, in the countryside. And um, there, um, the situation was uh, um, was quite um, desperate because uh, Romanian pressure to extract as much uh, agricultural resources from the countryside was heavy at the beginning and then actually increased. And um, uh, Romanians lied sy systematically. Maybe they didn't intend to lie, but that's how it happened. They promised that initially if you collect all of this harvest, because the harvesting region, uh, what was the most important first collect all the agricultural goods and then um, if you collect, you leave you half of it, but they didn't leave half of it, they took much more than half. And then the next year, okay, now the sowing region, please participate in the sowing campaign, you will still get half. In the past time we didn't uh, manage to do that, now we will try. And of course, they didn't have the second. It's that time when they started telling them nobody believed them. And when they started taking not only uh, the, uh, the produce, but in fact, even the productive exits like the tractors or, or the uh, cattle, right? Um, um, people were just, um, just were completely outraged, and not only they didn't participate in this, but they um, participated actively in uh, various forms of sabotage, right, to prevent this removal of assets and, and goods. And so the country, the situation in the countryside was bad, and that explains um, why uh, the support for um, pro-Soviet resistance grew. It didn't grow everywhere. Um, with the same speed, never reached everywhere the same level, but in several areas, especially those who were more forested, because for partisan activity, forests were uh, kind of almost um, sine qua non, right? And it's a sine qua non, and um, especially those in forested areas, the, the, the resistance increased, and the 
they became a serious nuisance to, to Romanians late the Germans who came to replace them at the very end of the occupation. Now, um, that was a second aspect. And then there was the aspect of the situation of the uh, lower classes in the cities, right? And the situation of the workers who uh, worked in the various um, um, enterprises. And we need to, to understand that the Soviets tried to, the, the scorched as, uh, as earth uh, policy that they pursued, basically they dismantled, blew up, and etc. Uh, whatever they could, the Soviets were very retreating. But the Romanians tried and they, they did manage with the support of the local population to restore these uh, product, product, product facilities right in the territory of Transnistria and they, they managed to do it quite quickly right to the chagrin of the Soviets when they intended and they realized that this Kochta's policy was not very effective they were very rattled by that right uh, so they restored it and um, they they tried to organize the production in such a way that everything was be directed to the support of the army and the war effort and of course they paid miserable salaries and wages and uh, um, they were much below subsistence level, uh, so pe people were uh, were basically starving in a, in a very bad situation. However, uh, in the in the days in particular, the situation was still much better than in the cities in Ukraine in the German zone of occupation because Romanians didn't pursue this uh, self-defeating policy. Of preventing good agricultural goods coming from this into the cities, as Germans pursued and they occupied Ukraine, they wanted to confiscate all those goods and ship to Romania. And Romanians didn't pursue this policy for a number of reasons. Um, some of them are just purely contingent, right? And um, so. Um, and in Transnistria, ironically, there were substantial uh, ethnic German villages, right, communities who produced a lot of agricultural goods. Uh, they had the right, that, like other farmers in Transnistria, to bring their goods to sale into Transnistria, and they were bringing them, and inter interdecessarily bringing them. And so Odessa was well, well supplied with agricultural goods. Uh, those who could buy, they did buy, and they did survive. Um, there were various types of contraband activities, selling and buying, commerce flourished in, uh, in, in Odessa. Uh, there was a very dark side to it because with the destruction of the Jewish community in Odessa, a lot of good led for the, from the Jews were basically planted by the locals and then sold and resold in the black market. So this kind of uh, black market activity in Odessa flourished and helped local population uh, survive. Uh, so those who were kind of more dynamic economically and uh, knew how to um, you know, to organize things, right, and quote unquote organize things, uh, those people uh, kind of uh, had it okay, but um, uh, people who worked in the publicly owned enterprises, in fact, Romanian state-owned enterprises, right, um, like workers, laborers, uh, they, um, they, they really uh, lived on the brink of starvation, and they also, in fact, by the end of the occupation, they also um, flooded the ranks of the resistance uh, in Odessa to people who actually uh, were especially um, uh, afraid of being um, uh, apprehended in, and um, uh, sent, in fact, shipped uh, to Germany as, a, as a forced laborers. And so they, they, they tried to escape this recruitment campaign and they also uh, where um, um, uh, filling the ranks of of the pro-Soviet resistance in Odessa, 
and, and some other cities as well. So there were like several planks to this story. Um, there is a that after the war there was kind of a myth in the emigre circles about the Odessa economic prosperity. And there was kind of some prosperity, but in comparison with what? And the comparison is the very um, um, drab existence and, and in fact starvation level and in fact even real hunger and famine in um, the other big cities like such as in, uh, Kiev and Kharkiv in um, uh, Ukraine, right? Uh, however, the lower classes still um, had it very bad and at this yeah so as I tried to explain uh, it's a kind of a complicated story it had many aspects to it we can also look at how various ethnic groups reacted because there were some differences there too um, uh, generational uh, change um, differences right uh, older uh, population, younger population, uh, more religious, less religious. Um, so um, people were different, of course, and uh, they acted differently under the impact of a uh, whole host of different factors. My practically all of my information comes from the archival sources. Uh, testimonies of survivors have been collected by various research institutions, both in America and in Israel. And uh, I access them too, access the files of the Righteous of the Nations, and um, oral interviews, and also written interviews. Um, I did talk to some survivors, but I don't, I don't think that it was a major um, kind of source for me. Uh, because uh, the body of information which was collected uh, by the previous generation of researchers is just so huge that um, uh, I don't think the you know, sort of interviews with the still living people would add much to it. Um, now, uh, but the archives, the archives are important. Let me explain uh, what it was, because archives were closed. This is a stupid Soviet uh, kind of legacy, right? Uh, and what happened after um, uh, the closing years of World War II and after, shortly after World War II, uh, that um, uh, when Romanians withdrew from Transnistria as well as from Bessarabia and Bukina, they tried to take all local archives from them, from the local um, administrative bodies that existed during the before then. Uh, evacuated them into Romania. But when the Soviets came, they confiscated them. They searched Romanian archives, and their policy was anything which would relate to the period of occupation, to the territories that the Soviets now considered theirs, should be kept in their territories. And so they moved them in the Soviet Union. But the problem was that the archivists quite often didn't know Romanian or low, knew it insufficiently. So um, the documents were eventually catalogued by, but uh, the description sometimes lacked precision and finesse, and they kept them in the archives in Odessa and in Kishinev and in, in Chernivtsi, and um, uh, some of them also in Moscow. Uh, um, but the access was very limited, so it's only in the 90s that they opened these ar archives. Unfortunately, for example, in Odessa, the archive is um, in a very old, basically um, falling apart building and um, well, very, very small room, reading room. So it, there are problems, and uh, there is still pro there are still problems with accessing files of the um, uh, um, Ukrainska Slutba Bespeki, that is. Uh, Ukrainian security service, which houses Soviet KGB, former KGB uh, materials. So um, there are problems, but with all of this, um, in Ukraine, uh, in Romania, it is better. But because Romanians try to hide their archives from the Soviet searching teams of archivists, right, who were trying to confiscate their, they 
they lost track of some of those materials. And so um, they are now trying to find them and bring them back. And so it's a long process. Uh, luckily, however, uh, U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. had a very extensive program, um, has, has had a very extensive program from the 1990s of um, uh, identifying archival materials from all over the world, including in Moldova, Ukraine, and uh, Romania, related to the Holocaust, right? But they have a very wide definition of how, what are the materials that relate. And so they searched those archives and ordered microfilm copies of those materials. And now they are stored in Washington. Those are, the access is, is, is easier for researchers there. The more so that it's now digitization, it's easier to make copies. So, um, and the same is true of, of Yad Vashem in uh, Jerusalem. So, that institution also had a, a similar program of um, uh, microfilming and storing materials from various archives. So, I worked on all of those different locations. Also, locations I also uh, ordered materials from. German archives, I didn't work with them, but German archives likely have um, good catalogs and um, you can order stuff um, without actually working them in them uh, by identifying materials uh, uh, from the catalogs. And so I, I, I try to look at the at, at, at the, this story from uh, as many perspectives as, as possible. And, uh, well, it's, it's a typical, of course, historians craft, right, to try to figure out how it really happened by figuring out what sources are reliable and what are not, and if they contradict each other, what we should believe and what we should not, right? And that's what I try to do. And of course, that's a lot of work, but I must tell you that I did more than actually I was able to put in this book, because when you work, we don't, you don't know what, what will become relevant or not. And you have several, for example, citations, you, you choose only one. And, and this is the beauty of our profession. When you research stuff, you keep encountering details which uh, surprise you. <laughs> and this, this is a process of discovery, right? And some of those details might seem not particularly important, uh, but um, eventually they kind of um, find their place in the, um, this bigger narrative and um, acquire particular colors or nuances add, uh, to the story. And, and that's, that's an amazing work. Uh, well, uh, you know, if you want to ask me about some of the most stunning uh, stories that I found, and this is what many people who read my book, they quote that. They say, oh, John, I cannot believe it. It could have happened. Uh, okay. And, and this is the um, story was uh, trumpeted and, uh, by the Soviets and still is uh, very widely known in today's uh, Odessa. Um, in Odessa, they still have the Museum of Partisan Glory. I think it's called still in the catacombs. Uh, catacombs was this um, extensive system of um, um, underground ga uh, galleries from uh, quarries, from where people quarried uh, stone for the construction of these seats uh, and, and, and um, um, uh, these reserves of um, local stone, which is good for construction and they were created there. So, so um, this process was kind of chaotic for centuries and um, the um, exact map, I, I don't know whether even it exists. Uh, it's probably, if it exists, it's kind of kept secret. So uh, these catacombs of the EU had been used uh, for decades already before World War II by the criminals to hide there. Then they were used by um, anti-Soviet resistance during the, the uh, civil war and then by the Soviet sequence of rights 
uh, occupied uh, during the war. And during World War II, Soviets decided to use catacombs against the occupiers. So they prepared these uh, guerrilla groups. Uh, NKVD prepared them, the party prepared them, the army, and even the trade unions prepared them. And in the typical Soviet uh, fashion, it was first kept um, um, top secret to such extent that even, for example, the NKVD men didn't know the army men. This was. On the other hand, the selection process was haphazard and um, messy, and um, uh, people who was who needed to know each other, they didn't know each other. But those who didn't uh, need to know each other sometimes knew each other. It was all, 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 um, all very messy. And um, the idea was that these people were uh, supplied with the explosives, with the weapons, with ammunition, with also the food reserves for about half a year. But because the idea was that half a year the Red Army would return. Well, you know, it didn't work quite that well, that, that, uh, uh, that way. Uh, and um, so Soviet uh, post war. Story, which was basically, of course, a mendacious propaganda, um, big, painted the picture of great exploits of these guerrilla groups, called calling them partisans, right? Uh, how they were blowing uh, tra up trains and buildings and uh, harassing Romanian occupiers and stuff and stuff. Now, what I found out that. The groups were highly ineffective. It's hard, it is actually difficult to say what exactly they achieved. Um, Romanians' record do not uh, indicate much of a damage done by them in the first time. The Romanians were very, very, very uh, afraid of them. There were a lot of rumors circulating in the past weeks of the occupation. And in fact, on the 22nd of October, um, the building of the headquarters of uh, Romanian military commander in the city were blown up. The military garrison, right, and um, the commander himself died, and a bunch of other officers and soldiers. But it appears that the bomb was kept in, in a safe, in a safe box in the building. It was not the result of the partisan activity. The building was mined before the Soviet withdrawal, and Romanians failed to. Uh, uh, to find this uh, this mine in the building, and nevertheless, uh, Romanians believe that the catacomb uh, guerrillas were behind this. They responded by this horrendous reprisal against the Jews, the Jewish population, whom they collectively held responsible. So maybe up to twenty thousand people were killed as a result of this horrendous horrendous reprisals, murdered, in fact, right. But the groups themselves in catacombs, they, they didn't do much of anything, it appears. However, almost immediately, they were betrayed uh, by the liaisons outside of the catacombs. And um, uh, Romanians managed to close the entrances in the catacombs and put their sentinels there. And so the people were not receiving enough air, and then they started to experience lack of food, and and then um, they literally went mad. And they started killing each other because they suspected the charge of treason, execution followed, and they reached a point where they resorted to cannibalism, killing each other. The selection process was, we will kill this one because he is not a party member, but we will not kill this one because he is a party member, and the party member, he will eat the non-party member. But of course, then they ate the non-party members, all the party members were left, and then, well, you guessed it. So as a result of it, maybe one of them survived, maybe nobody survived of this group, but all of them were apprehended except two or three who actually just left the catacombs and lived somewhere outside of them uh, until the situation changed. But um, that was 
And there was also a lot of traitors among the commanders themselves and KVD men. Some of them actually became a tank court and served in the Romanian counterintelligence service of Nigeria. And the same was true of the so-called uh, underground op corps, which was led in the surface, was supposed to be in charge of all the partisan illegal activity, and also was, was just betrayal on the betrayal. So instead of what we, the Soviets called partisan glory, uh, the, we have uh, guerrilla infamy, if you will, and it's in an incredible, like one tragedy upon another. Just give you one example, and this will end on this. There was somebody who called Soldatenko, who actually was one of those who participated in this cannibalism, right? Was head of one of the groups. And after the war, uh, his wife and daughter received just a note that he's a hero, blah, blah, blah. And then they found their correspondence with the conversation. Okay, my, my daughter writes, my father the hero, but not exactly did he do. And where did he die? Where, I want to know. And the, 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 the people in KGB kind of corresponds to them, we found it inexpedient to disclose information, it should be cool. And so the, the answer was um, uh, very short and that um, he was executed by them. Of course he was killed by his own, right? And, and, and this, is the, this is the epitome of this awful story of um, uh, the catacomb guerrillas uh, which had, had been sold for century generation uh, by the Soviets in, 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 in just in the polar opposite way. Uh, novels were written, Valentin Kataev role and all, there were movies made after that, and all this was like, from the beginning to the end. Every, every shred of information they had to the people was like, and there is still a museum doesn't tell you much in the catacombs, right, what this exactly do, but in the museum of, of partisan glory. And it still survives, and people still believe and go there, is it? and I visited just for fun, right? I wonder if this here. But all of this is just a sheer lie, right? And um, there is another story like that too, but I don't want to go to that. It's basically the same kind of story. Um, that's how the Soviet um, historical narrative basically is not reflective of reality. But it's also how people don't want to know. Uh, I, my book is, be, is uh, now being prepared for publication in, in Romanian. Um, and I'm very happy because the publisher is a very respectable publisher in Romania. And I hope to publish it either in Russian or in Ukrainian, but I still was not able to find in Ukraine a publisher who would be interested, which is very surprising to me, right? Uh, um, because I think it would it would sell in, in Odessa. It, uh, 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 the people from Odessa are actually very interested in the history of their city. They, there are a lot of enthusiasts over history, and I still can't understand why the publisher cannot get it, but they would probably sell the book, right? And so I wrote to several of them, and well, uh, okay. Uh, now, um, why historians don't work? I, uh, there is one, at least one historian that I know, kind of popular, he writes regular history, and he, he, he wrote about this. I don't know what the echo was of, of this, um, of his public because my feeling is they talk to others they don't want to know the tragedy like you go to their museums it's still the Soviet type of history at least so it was two years ago when I was there I was not last year there because of the COVID and uh, I'm not going to go there earlier than the next year um, so um, the museums, the kind of official discourse is still the same. And it's kind of strange because it's independent Ukraine, but I think on the local level, the establishment is very much part of this still Soviet type people. 
uh, who are maybe just lazy intellectually and they don't want to question themselves and it's easy for them to just repeat they, what they knew or they thought that they knew. Of course, they didn't know, but that's just what they were told, right? And I think the people on the streets, um, um, it's easier for them to live with the received wisdom. Um, and the narratives uh, in today's Ukraine, two competing narratives like Western nationalistic and pro-Soviet, right? Um, these two uh, 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 how would I say that? How would I put it? I would probably put it like nuance. They do not want complicated stories. They want the stories of heroism, resistance, suffering. This is the dominant trope which is which are employed, but when it becomes nuanced, gray, multicolored, and stuff, I don't think they are ready. At least this is my impression to process it. And and unfortunately, the Soviet type history was the history of black and white, good and bad, and you can flip the colors, but introduce new colors, make things more complex, it's the next step, right? And this is a historian's craft. This is a historian's craft. This is what historians need to do. That's why they need historical profession, to make people comprehend complexities of societies in which they live. This complexity has the virtue of helping them live peacefully and solve their differences peacefully. If things are simple, it is the surest way, it's surest invitation to disaster. It, it's always black and white and kind of, they always, it, it, not, I would not say always, but quite often lead to, lead to crashes. Now, Unfortunately, uh, historical profession in today Ukraine is underfunded, uh, and um, uh, it's not independent enough from the government. People think of themselves as serving a political, politi particular political project. I think historians have to steer away from politics. They don't serve. They should not be serving any nation, nationalist, any idea, anything. They should be serving their profession and the standards of their profession. And let the public decide. Okay? And I don't think this, this kind of understanding of the essence of what historical profession is, right, is still part. Well, not still, but yet, it's still, it, it's not part yet. Uh, of uh, uh, cultural reality, so to say, in Ukraine. And that's, I think, it's it's not an easy, I don't have an easy answer how to, to uh, change it. I What I know is that I, I just tried to tell the story as best I could that I discovered. And this is the story which is exceedingly, they tried to, to show complex, right? And that's what they said. And, um, how that's Association of Ukrainian Studies, right? That's what they said, right? That that's a, my study is nuanced when they honorable mention. And I and I'm very happy that they appreciated this nuanced character of my research. This is what I actually I fact I, what I wanted to achieve. Right. As you can imagine I can talk for hours about that. I'm very glad that I found uh, such an interested listener in you and I hope that the audience will find some of what I said in, in interest and maybe even read my book and then well I don't know maybe they will start be interested in this whole period right and the whole story but thank you very much for your interest I it was not painful at all in fact it was very engaging. I, I like your question. I very much appreciate your interest and your time, and I am very grateful uh, to you for that.